right, good evening. If you would, let's uh, keep saying turn in your hymnals, but this is in the spiral book once again. The Way of the Cross Leads Home, page 54. The Way of the Cross Leads Home, I Must Needs Go Home. Let's stand as we sing. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way I must needs go on in the blood sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the height sublime, where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home. The says come and I seek my home where he waits at the open door the way of the cross leads home the way of the cross leads home it is sweet to know as I onward go the way of the cross leads home seated. All right, good evening everyone. We're going to do our missionary prayer letter and then our opening prayer together here. Uh, the missionary prayer letter is from Russ and Sylvia Daniels to Uganda and it says, Dear friends, our return to Uganda at the end of May was delayed for two weeks because my COVID PCR test came back with a false positive. I wasn't sick, which was confirmed by three home tests. However, this delay allowed me to fly out to San Antonio, Texas to be with our son, David, and his family after their premature birth of their third child, Luke. What a joy it was to lay my hand on the tiny baby born at just one pound, seven ounces. Please pray for his continued growth. When we did start our trip to Uganda, one of our flights was delayed, causing us to miss our connection in Europe. We had to be rerouted through two other airports, but finally arrived in Uganda on the morning of June 15th. Our luggage didn't keep up with us through all five flights, but it arrived and was delivered to us the next day, praise the Lord. The trip was hard on Sylvia because of her health condition, and it took her longer than usual to recover and get over the jet lag. We only had a few days to start getting set up in our apartment in Kampala before the arrival of Pastor Ron Williams and Bruce Collett, who came to officially open two village church buildings funded by Palmetto Avenue Baptist Church in Sanford, Florida. Both church openings were attended by hundreds of people and were great testimonies to their communities. Pastor Ron and Bruce also spoke in a number of schools in the Bambara area. Over 250 people made professions of faith in Christ during their visit. However, as they were preparing to leave, Bruce tested positive for COVID and had to delay his departure for one week. Later, he wrote to say, I was so disappointed that I could not leave, but by the end of the week, I was so happy to be exactly where God wanted me and to learn his will for my life. Thank you for my best trip to Africa ever. That same week, Global Baptist Training Foundation professors Bruce Snavely and Larry Bazaar arrived to teach two homiletics classes for a group of 37 new church planters. I was not able to participate in the week of training because I came down with COVID. It has been a mild case this time, but I still have a lingering cough. We hoped and prayed that Sylvia wouldn't get it, but she now has some cough as well. Please pray for her recovery and continued healing. In August, I'll be meeting with our national pastors to discuss how to move forward with the Bible Institute trainings while we work to meet the requirements to upgrade our program 
to a small-scale Bible college that will be recognized by Uganda's Ministry of Education. Our return to Uganda has gotten off to a rough start, but we are thrilled to be back. Thank you for your prayers and support. Words in Uganda, Russ and Sylvia Daniels. I do not have any turned-in additions to the prayer list tonight. Uh, my pastor may have some when he gets up here. Do we have any from the floor that need to be made aware of that we can pray for? Brother Larrabee? Just to repeat that, um, Brother Tim Lapata's father passed away, so please be in prayer for him and his family. Yeah. Katie has pneumonia. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to come together to gather as a church family tonight. That we can come and worship you freely in America. That we have the ability to bring our petitions before you. And your Holy Spirit intercedes for us. We think tonight of those that were mentioned from the floor. We uh, think about the Beasley family traveling back to Atlanta with their car problems and uh, with their special needs child. Be with that family and allow them to make it to where you would have them be to serve you. And that you would work out the issues that they're have delayed their travels uh, in the way that you have possible, that they would meet the people they would need to and uh, form the relationships that they would going forward, that they can serve you in the future. Uh, we ask your blessing on Katie, who has the pneumonia. Please put your healing touch on her life, that she can recover uh, quickly from that. We think about uh, Tim Lapata and uh, the passing of his father. We ask you to comfort him and his mother as they go through this period of grief we pray specifically for uh, the peace that passes all understanding that only you can provide come on to them uh, we think about the warple family ask for uh, somebody to be brought into their lives that would help them uh, come to know you as savior and bring them uh, to uh, um, follow your direction in their lives as a family we think of all the others that are on our prayer list, as well as our missionaries that are having services around the world. We ask your blessing on tonight's service. Be with Pastor Morton as he brings your word to us. Bless the song service as well, that our hearts would be opened and we would be ready to receive what you'd have for us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's just like his great love. Let's sing, A Friend I Have Called Jesus whose love is strong and true. Page 23 there. It's just like his great love. Let's stand as we sing. This will be the handshaking song for this evening. Think of the words as we sing. Never fails, howe'er tis tried. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is 
strong and true, and never fails how e'er tis tried, no matter what I do. I've sinned against this love of His, but when I knell to pray, confessing all my guilt to Him, the sin clouds rolled away. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Sometimes the clouds of trouble bedim the sky above. I cannot see my Savior's face. I doubt his wondrous love. But he from heaven's mercy seat, beholding my despair, in pity burst the clouds between, and shows me he is there. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away, it's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Let's turn around and greet each other with a handshake this evening. Verse number three, when sorrow's clouds o'ertake me. When sorrow's clouds o'ertake me and break upon my head. When life seems worse than useless and I were better dead. I take my grief to Jesus then, nor do I go in sunshine after rain. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Let's sing that last verse. Oh, I could sing forever. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine, of all his care and tenderness for this strife of mine. His love is in and over all, and wind and waves obey. When Jesus whispers, peace be still, and rolls the clouds, 
Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Amen. Great singing tonight. And uh, you may be seated. And we have announcements for you. Don't have them yet. There they are. All right, so our, some of our announcements here. Um, keep in mind the teen snack attack is from June. Uh, we, need, we need people to fill in the months from June to the end of the year. Well, now it's July to the end of the year. So just, if you can, get, uh, get signed up for that and uh, see the pointers for that sign-up list if you can. Um, just, uh, just a short time after the service on Sunday night to, get to, to just spend time with the teens and get to know them a little bit. Um, July 30th here is uh, this week. Um, Saturday, the last Saturday in July, uh, we have Saturday Saturation. So come out to that. It's at 930. Um, I think there's going to be Tim's Donuts there, maybe. Yeah, strong likelihood. Yeah, strong, strong likelihood. Uh, anyway, so Tim's Donuts at 930, and then more, more than likely. And then we'll go out about 10 or so, uh, maybe a little bit after, and try to um, just knock on doors and uh, try to just get the gospel out to folks and um, definitely a need for that many many doors out there to, to knock on so uh, come out for that it's a good time uh, just even if you can come out for half an hour or actually knocking doors for half an hour that'd be great now if you can do an hour if you can do five hours that'd be great too so uh, it, it is well needed uh, uh, the uh, academy uh, christian school academy needs substitute teachers aides and um, uh, and others as well. Just please see Pastor Morton or de uh, deacons for more information, more details on that. Um, and then also uh, the first day of school is August 8th, so don't forget to mark that in your calendars, August 8th. Uh, looking forward to a great school year this year, uh, so just keep that in mind as well. Uh, this Sunday, after the morning service, uh, we will have a pitch and meal, so if you can bring a dish to pass, um, more than more than just enough for, for you, uh, that'd be great. And we're going to have a softball game out back. Um, we are currently putting up uh, a backstop for that. We got the bleachers moving and different things like that. So kind of gearing up towards Sunday, and that will have also an afternoon service. We'll begin at 2 o'clock, um, so don't forget that. And then after the afternoon service, we will have a church, uh, after, the, after the actual service, we'll have a church family softball game activity. Uh, so be ready for that. Um, it might be a little hot out there. There's not a lot of shade, so just uh, just be mindful of that. Bring lots of water, different things like that. Um, also, Brother Larry Harris, the book guy, will be here Sunday, July 31st, same day um, as the softball uh, activities. Um, he will have a table with discounted books and Bibles for purchase, um, I imagine, out in the foyer area. So just be mindful of that. Larry Harris, the book guy, will be here July 31st. Uh, that's all the announcements that I currently have at this time, and um, we'll have our offering. All right, let's pray for the offering. Dear Lord, we uh, thank you for the blessings that you provide, the health that we have, that we can work and provide for our families. We ask now that you bless the tithes and offerings that are given back to you uh, as we support Cornerstone Baptist Church here locally, uh, the work that's here in Lawrence, as well as supporting our missionaries around the world. Uh, we ask you to bless what's given that you can further it to do your work uh, in the way that you would see souls saved and lives changed uh, in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs>
song, Stepping in the Light, Trying to Walk in the Steps of the Savior, Stepping in the Light, Stepping in the Light. Page number 18 there. Let's all stand, if you would. Page 18, Stepping in the Light, as we stand. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior and King, shaping our lives by his blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of life, pressing more closely to him who is leading when we are tempted to turn from the way, trusting the arm that is strong to defend us. Happy, how happy our praises each day. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping into life, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of life, walking in footsteps of gentle forbearance, footsteps of faithfulness, mercy, and love, looking to him for the grace freely promised, happy, how happy our journey above, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, Stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Verse 4 there as the last. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upward, still upward, will follow our guide. When we shall see him, the King, in his beauty, happy, how happy our place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Amen. Great singing tonight, and uh, you may be seated. And we'll have Pastor Morton come this evening. Well, good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight. And uh, welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church. And we're going to continue our study here in a moment in 1 Peter chapter 5. If you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I'll tell you all about my little girl that was born. And uh, I didn't mention that earlier, but Micah Claire Morton was born Monday at 6.16 a.m. And she was 9 pounds, 3.8 ounces 21 inches long and she's got a head full of hair and it's awesome we were spoiled first night she slept great at least I slept great I don't know um, everyone asked how the baby did I have no idea I slept through the night and my woke up the next morning I said wow the, she must have slept all through the night she went no just you so uh, mom and baby are doing great thank you for asking we have a follow-up appointment tomorrow and uh, just a touch of jaundice, and so hopefully that'll go away soon. But thank you so much for asking. Uh, she chose to stay home tonight just to rest and uh, make sure that the baby is going to do great for her visit tomorrow. And I, you're going to get plenty of chances to squeeze those gigantic trademark Morton cheeks, okay? And so seriously, Micah's cheeks are just so squeezable and looking forward to her coming, Lord willing, Sunday. Lord willing, Sunday. So uh, before we get into it, I forgot one announcement earlier. The ladies' conference in August 5th and 6th we've been announcing, there is one free ticket available. So if one lady is been, has held off because of the financial side of it and you would like to go to the meeting, we have one free ticket. So if you're a lady that wants to go now that there's a, there's a free ticket available, uh, please see me right after service, okay? All right, thank you so much for that. First Peter chapter 5, and look at it with me in verses 4 through 9. 4 through 9. First, chapter, uh, first Peter chapter 5, verses 4 through 9. The Bible says this. It says, 
And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Verse number 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And we'll go ahead and pause and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Today, the Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of gathering together uh, tonight as your people. I pray that you would just take the uh, simple instruction from the Word of God tonight and speak to our hearts. I pray that we leave here with a deeper knowledge and understanding of the Scripture. And I pray that you would just guide our thoughts. We give you all the praise and honor and glory for it. And just please be with all those that have already been discussed on the prayer list tonight. We think about Tim Lapata and his family losing their father and losing their loved one. I pray that you would just comfort he and his mother and his family during this time of grief. I pray that you would just work out all the details uh, that now follow that. Lord, I pray that you would just comfort them, uh, help them to know peace, and help them just trust in you during this time. Help us as his church family to gather around him and support him and his family and just be there for him any, any way that we can. Please be with all those that have recently lost loved ones. We think about Mrs. Williams and the Bauer family. We think about uh, the Longworth family and others. I pray that you would just continue to comfort them, give them just an extra measure of grace to get through this trial in their life, and we'll give you all the praise and honor and glory for it. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we don't, my wife's not here to keep count, so uh, would you mind, Mrs. Stanick, keeping count? So all the kids that want to partake tonight, we have some sour straws, right? Some sour straws to give away, and the word is humility, right? The word is humility, humble, any variation of those two words, humbleness, humble, humility, uh, anything like that, make a mark, okay? Then turn that into my, into my mother-in-law. And then she will see who the winner is, all right? But in, in verses 1 through 3, if we took the time to read it, you would, uh, you would see that we, it's laid out the elders' responsibilities uh, in detail, what those responsibilities for the elders were. In verses 10 through 14, it deals with preparing ourselves for suffering. And uh, I'm not going to deal with any of that tonight. Uh, good topics, good subjects, but there's one word that kept popping up in our text, uh, verse number... Uh, let's see here, in verse number, First uh, Peter chapter 5, look at it with me. In verse number six, 5, it says humility. Verse number, the end of verse number 5, it says humble. Verse number 6, it says humble yourselves. And I think the prevailing theme of the verses that we just read deal with humility. And I want to uh, deal with that just for a few minutes. Uh, humility tonight. Humility defined by the dictionary is this. It's freedom from pride or arrogance. Freedom from pride or arrogance. It also means the quality or state of being humble. And some synonyms for this word is uh, down to earth, uh, humbleness, meekness, lowliness. That's interesting. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Lowliness, and also it carries the idea of, uh, of modest living and modesty, all right? Uh, in the Bible, in your King James Bible, the word humility, the best that I could find and count, is mentioned seven times. The word humility, uh, the word humble, the word humble is mentioned 24 times, humbleness is mentioned one time, uh, the word lowly is mentioned six times, a, a variation of the word lowly, lowliness is mentioned two times. In, in, in the scope of scripture, that's not a lot of mentions in the Bible concerning this topic. So one would say, why would you blow a whole message on that, Pastor Morton? Well, the Bible also says on the flip side of that, What's the opposite of humility, humbleness, and, and humility and humble? It's prideful, um, arrogant, and that's mentioned quite a bit in Scripture too. The word pride, the word pride is mentioned 46 times in the King James Bible. Uh, also the word proud, the word proud is mentioned 47 times. The word haughty is mentioned 10 times, and all of those carry the same idea, being proud. 
Listen, that to me, if the Lord speaks of a subject just once, we should run our antenna up. But if, it, if he mentions it 46, 47, and more times, it's definitely something that we should uh, draw an interest to learning about. And here's some truths about humility. Just jumping right into it tonight. Truths about humility, number one, it starts with the mind. It starts with the mind. This, this matter of humility is a matter of the mind. Turn now with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and look at it with me in verse number 12. Colossians chapter 3, in verse number 12. The Bible says this, it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, what's the next three words? Humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. It's interesting to me, before you and I can even begin the process of being humble the way that we need to, the way that Scripture commands us to, we need to first address a matter of our mind. You know what pr pride is? Pride is having a higher view of ourself than we should. It's not saying that, you know, it's not talking about uh, having self-esteem. It's just thinking more highly of yourself than we ought to. There's some people that think that they've arrived. There's some people that think that uh, they're God's gift to Christianity and everything else you can name. That's, that's exactly why we're talking about what we're talking about, because that kind of thinking shows a deficiency in the matter of humility. Uh, but humbleness, the word humbleness from our definition earlier carries along the idea of lowliness, lowliness, thinking of ourselves and looking at ourselves biblically the way that we should. What does the Bible say that what's a good self-evaluation of ourselves? We are just sinners saved by grace. And if we keep that view of ourselves, we'll, we'll be all right. We're just sinners saved by grace. We shouldn't look down our noses at anybody else. Just because we've uh, had years of the Holy Spirit working on us. But we need to be uh, humble and realize that we're just sinners saved by grace. Pride is the opposite of humble. Pride is thinking of ourselves better than and higher than we ought to think. And humility takes a low view of self. In Romans chapter 12, look at it with me in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3. Romans chapter 12, verse number 3, the Bible says this. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Romans chapter 12, you're already in verse, uh, chapter 12. Look at it with me in verse 16. Romans chapter 12, verse 16 says this. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things. It says, mind not high things, but condescend to, to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. This matter of being proud begins in our mind with the wrong type of thinking about self. And we're going to address that here in a moment. Here are some different ways that people are proud in their thinking and proud with their minds. People actually think, and they're prideful in their thinking by thinking that they are good. They're a good person. And, you know, some people around here, if you ask them, you know, how you're doing, good. No, you're not. They say you're not good. And they got, they've got a biblical leg to stand on because of Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, the Bible says, And he said unto him, why cost thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. In Romans chapter 3 verse 12, the Bible says, They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. If you're dealing with someone in terms of uh, their salvation and giving them the gospel, a lot of people actually think that they are good enough. They're good enough. Uh, I may not be as bad as somebody else, but uh, I, I'm definitely not as bad as so-and-so. I'm a pretty good person. The Bible says you're not, even, you're not even a good person. It says there's nobody here that even does good. There's nobody that can do good enough to, to merit eternal life. And that's definitely a, a prideful way of thinking is thinking that because, because they're a good person and because they do good things, then they're going to be good enough to go to heaven. And the Bible clearly says that's not the case. 
Another way is this. People are proud in their thinking by thinking, actually, that their life is their life. It's my life, and it's my life, and I can do with it as I please. Well, it's, it's not our life, because none of us here can uh, adequately claim that we've purchased our life. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. The Bible reminds us of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? It says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Is that a contradiction? You just told me it's not my life. But then the verse says, uh, in your body and in your spirit. That's a beautiful thing. That's not a contradiction. It's not saying that you have the right to your life. That's, that's the, the liberty that Christ has given us. We have liberty to do with our life as we choose, but he wants us in the liberty that he's given us to freely choose to live for him in subjection to him and uh, give our life back to him for his service. The Bible also says that people have a prideful way of thinking because they, they actually think that they'll work their way to heaven. They think that they can work their way to heaven. I'm, I'm a good person, and uh, I, I, I try to do good. I try to do the best that I can. I try to do good things. Well, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's a familiar verse dealing with the subject. Look at it with me in Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse number 6. The Bible says, But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do all, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. For that person that thinks that they could merit eternal life by being good and doing good and works, the Bible says that everything that you and I could muster as something that's a good work that we would try to do to go to heaven, the Bible describes it as being filthy rags. Filthy rags. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. We're all guilty because of our sins and iniquities. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says this, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Well, Brother Morton, if we can't be good enough, we can't do good enough, can't work good enough to get to heaven, what's the solution? I mean, what's the answer to having a prideful mind and thinking pridefully? I'm glad you asked. The, the Bible gives us an answer. How do we keep our mind and thoughts humble? It's a good question to ask. How do we keep our mind and our thoughts humble? It starts by giving ourselves a pride reality check. Give our pride a reality check. You know, we, someone that would think that they're pretty good, think that they've got it all together, and that they're, they're a good person. The Bible says, here's a reality check for your pride. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says all, and all means all. That means you, me, everyone alive today. It's for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How do we keep our mind and thoughts humble? Well, also we compare ourselves to a holy God. By comparing ourselves to a holy God. Do you know what man's natural tendency to do today is? Compare themselves with someone else. And then when we compare ourselves to someone that we know is inferior to where we are, we feel, we feel good about ourselves. And we do that. We do that from time to time, don't we? We, we take ourselves, we compare ourselves to somebody else, and because of the fact that the person we're comparing ourselves to, we're better than in some areas, we think we're doing okay. That's a prideful way of thinking. And how do we fix the prideful way of thinking? We compare ourselves not to each other, where in some instances we'll measure up. We compare ourselves to a holy God, and nobody in this place measures up to him. In uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says this. Isaiah 6, 5 says, Then said I, Woe is me, 
for I am undone. Do you know who's speaking here? Anybody know who's speaking here? Someone said it, just quiet. Who, who's speaking here? The prophet Isaiah, okay? The prophet Isaiah. I mean, he's a prophet. He's a man that uh, did a lot of great things, was a great man of God, had the power of God on him, did a wonderful things. This is how he's describing himself. And th- this, time out, this is, a, this is just a side issue here. Here's a good way to know that man didn't write the Bible. Because if man wrote a Bible, he wouldn't in his natural, natural self write something bad about himself. The fact that Isaiah is describing himself the way that he does here in a moment, we're going to read it, it's proof that man didn't write the Bible. Because given the opportunity and the platform to write a book after yourself and to write a book in the Bible and to be truthful about one's own self, it's definitely not someone uh, a man did by himself. It says this, whoa, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the who, the king, capital K-I-N-G, the Lord, all caps of host. Do you know what, do you know why this man of God, a good man, a man that did a lot of great good things for the Lord, is describing himself the way that he is? Because he's not describing himself compared to anyone else. In, In comparison to an almighty God, he doesn't even compare. I am undone. I am a a man that's, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. He saw himself for who he truly was when he compared himself to a holy God. And we'd be wise to do the same thing too. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, the Bible says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into, into the world to save sinners. Of whom... I am chief. Who is this speaking? Paul, the Apostle Paul. Once again, Paul was given the the ability and opportunity to pen a portion of Scripture. And he describes himself. Other people describing Paul describe him as what? The greatest Christian ever walked the earth. How does Paul describe Paul in comparison to a holy, righteous God? Chiefest of sinners. He's the chiefest of sinners. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 12. The Bible says this. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or, listen to this, compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not what? Wise. A prideful person, once again, will take their, their life and their walk with God and their Christianity and their testimony and they'll compare it to somebody else's and think they are what they need to be. Friend, we, do not, we don't need to have the attitude of we've arrived because we're better than so and so. We always look upward and compare ourselves to a righteous God, and that will always give us more work to do about ourselves. We esteem others. How do we keep our mind and thoughts humble? We esteem others higher and better than ourselves. Esteeming others higher and better than ourselves. Pride in our flesh and our pride uh, has us esteem ourselves above everyone where we are the only thing that we're focusing on. Me, 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 I, 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 it's me first, I, it's me. But the Bible, it contradicts our flesh. And the Bible says we should be esteeming others than ourselves. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, the Bible says this. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Having the right mindset, a lowly esteem of themselves, causes you and I to esteem others where they need to be before ourselves. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible says this, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. It says in honor, What's the next three words? Preferring one another. Putting the needs of others before ourselves. Having, thinking about others before we think about ourselves. Praying for the needs of others before we pray about the needs of ourselves. 
It's all about others. The Christian life is all about others. Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry was all about others. He encouraged his disciples that were in the inner circle of his ministry to make their lives and ministries about others. He's encouraging you and I as his disciples today to make our lives, our existence, our purpose about others. It's all about others. When we get prideful and we start putting ourselves, esteeming ourselves above others, we're losing the entire purpose of our existence. It's all about others. Focus on serving and pleasing God instead of pleasing our own prideful self. Uh, focus on serving and pleasing God instead of pleasing our own prideful selves. And I want to interject this too, and also about serving God instead of serving others. That kind of seems like I just contradicted myself. You just told us to serve others, but we shouldn't focus on serving others. And you ser serving God. No, it's the, the prim primary responsibility we have is to serve the Lord, love the Lord, do everything we do for Him because we love Him. That's our motivation. Do you understand that if we start doing things just for, uh, for the sake, it's man worship. Anybody ever heard of man worship before? Uh, they, it's called man worship. They do what they do for a person. There's people back, back in my home church. My pastor's been there for 50 years. Some people broke his heart when he announced his retirement. They said, you know what? If you're not going to be the pastor here, I'm out of here. Like they were doing him a favor. You understand, any church that you find yourself a part of, you should be there because of the Lord and not a man. Because when you wrap up what you do in that church because of a man, you have just man worshiped and not worshiped God. Okay? That's a lot of, a lot of times when pastors step down and church splits happen and people leave, it's because a lot of people in the congregation had their focus on a man worshiping him instead of focusing God and worshiping him. That, that's the truth. It is. It really is. A lot of people today just wrap themselves up with their loyalty and everything into a person. And a lot of good people get hurt that way. You know why? Because the best of men is a man at best. And if you follow a man, a person, an individual... For any length of time, they will disappoint you and let you down. And if you wrapped up everything you do because of a person, got the wrong motivation. Got the wrong motivation. Do you know why a Christian can be unmovable and steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Doesn't mean because that church never changes pastors. It means because an unchanging God is the one that they're doing what they're doing for. That's why you do what you do. And if I let you down, if I embezzle 100 grand from the church and they fire me and I go to prison, nobody here should leave unless the Lord leaves you, allows you to leave because you're doing what you're doing for the Lord and not a man, okay? If someone you know, someone you know and look up to and respect in the ministry gets caught in infidelity, you don't, you don't change anything about what you're doing for the Lord because the Lord didn't commit infidelity and disappoint you, a man did. And a lot of people, a lot of people, get sucked up into man worship man worship and not god worship we need to have the right kind of heart by focusing on and serving the the lord instead of our own selves and serving other people for the wrong motivation acts chapter 20 verse 19 the bible says this it says serving the pastor is that what it say serving colin morton is that what it say is that what it says no it says serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befall me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Do you know why Paul continued in his ministry and we, he can truthfully say he finished his course? You don't think people in Paul's ministry disappointed him? People walked away from him left and right. People disappointed him, betrayed him, hurt him, deceived him, lied about him. Uh, apparently, the ministry here, this is Paul's encouraging uh, tidbit of the ministry to young preacher boys. Ready? Uh, pe preacher boys that think it's just punching in your clock, sitting behind a de desk, and getting a check. And everyone loves your preaching. You know what Paul says the ministry is? Tears and temptations which befell me. 
That's the reality of the ministry. It comes with hardships. You know why Paul could continue on and finish the course faithfully that God had gave him? It wasn't because people let him down. It was because his focus through the tears and temptation always remained on the Lord. On the Lord whom he was serving. Uh, number two, we need to have a humble mind. But number two, we need to have a humble heart. It not only begins humility, the matter of humility uh, starts in your mind, it continues in your heart. We need to have a humble heart. Once pride has taken root in our minds, uh, having us have a, a loftier view of ourself, this church wouldn't survive without me. This church wouldn't survive without me. This church needs my tithe. I'm the only Sunday school teacher this church has. I'm the best pastor that's ever preached in this church. Having a loftier view of ourself will lead to other things. And let me just say this right now. There's no aspect or facet of God's church or ministry that's reliant on one person. It's the Lord's church and the Lord's ministry. And he will sustain it as he pleases. There's people back home I worked with before in the sports department. You have those coaches that, you know, just graduated high school and they still got, you know, they still got the athleticism and the strength that they had in, in a high school. And they think that this sports program needs me. I am God's gift to coaching. And after they got blown out, they realized, you know what, I probably should have had a better approach to this thing. Because there's always someone that's going to be better than us in some things and stronger than us in some things. And that's why we always have to have a humble view of ourselves and realize, you know what? This, this ministry that I find myself a part of, I am a one member of a one awesome body. And although, although I, I am instrumental in what I'm doing for the body, it's the Lord's church. It's the Lord's body. And he could always chop off and graft in a new pinky toe. He could always, if I chip my pinky toenail, he could always put one artificially back on. I'm not saying that it, the nursery worker is your pinky toenails or anything. Okay, don't, don't miss the point, all right? But the point is, it's God's church and he will sustain his work. We need to have a humble heart. Second Chronicles chapter 32, the Bible says this. If you were to read the whole chapter, it's a great chapter. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 32, verses 1 through 24, the Bible says, uh, basically summarized up, let me just read a summary for you. Hezekiah did so many great things. Uh, the wicked king sent a cherub. Sennacherib came against him, and uh, he prayed and asked deliverance from the Lord. This is Hezekiah, and the Lord gave him deliverance, and look what happened. Actually, let's turn there. It's too good. Second Chronicles chapter 32. How could you have a prideful heart, Pastor Morton? Well, ask King Hezekiah. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Look at it with me in verse 25. The Bible says this. It says... But Hezekiah rendered not again to the benefit done unto him. He forgot who was the one that allowed him to benefit, benefit the victory from uh, the power that God gave him. The, the ability that God gave him. He forgot everything that led him to getting the victory. Look what happened. Read this out loud. If you're there, okay, let's read that together. Here we go. One, two, three. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah, what? Humbled himself for the pride of his, what? Heart. Even in victory, we need to be humble. You know, it, it's, it's easy to be humble in defeat, isn't it? I mean, when your tail's between your leg and you're just, your back's against the wall and you don't know what to do and it's just, man, you just, man, it's easy to be humble in victory. But, man, it's, it's a different story when you're on the top side, when things are going great. Hezekiah, in a moment, forgot everything that led him to hitting his knees and asking the Lord to bring deliverance. The moment deliverance and victory came, his, his heart puffed up with pride. That just shows you how quickly someone can be prideful. I mean, he's crying on his knees asking God for deliverance. And the next moment, he's just like, look what I did. And we got to constantly keep a check on our own prideful hearts and not allow it to get lifted up with pride. 
Number three, humble yourself so God doesn't have to. Humble yourself so God doesn't have to. The Bible uh, tells us over and over again, we may not get to it tonight, but the Bible says that the Lord has a heavy hand. Have you ever seen that phrase describing the Lord as having a heavy hand, a heavy-handed God? That, that just, that's proof that, man, we, we need to humble ourselves so God doesn't have to. God doesn't have to take that uh, heavy hand and, and bring it down in our life and bring us low and bring us down to our knees before we get it right. Let's humble ourselves so God doesn't have to. Let me show one, one instance of this, and then we'll wrap it up for tonight and pick it up next week. Second Chronicles, turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14. The Bible says this. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14. The Bible says this. It says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. That's God's desire. God's desire is you and I through the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings through the Word of God and, and other sources, we just recognize the issue and on our own freely correct the issue. That's God's desire. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. Those people that make God out to be this bully that just looks for people just to browbeat all the time, God's saying, listen, my desire is that you humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The Lord's motive for, for us getting right and humbling ourselves is a restored relationship to resume again. The Lord created us, uh, mankind in the garden for the purpose of fellowship and relationship. And that desire from the heart of our Savior hasn't changed thousands of years later. He desires with all of his being a relationship with you and I. And he wants you and I to humble ourselves so that we can restore that relationship and pick it up where we left off. Turn with me, Matthew chapter 18 verse 4. Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 4, the Bible says this, and then we're done. Matthew 18 and verse number 4, the Bible has this to say. Matthew 18 and verse number 4, the Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall humble what himself as this little child, the same is what greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what the Lord attributed as being one of the greatest people ever? One of the greatest. We're all consumed with being the greatest Christian, right? We want to be the greatest and want to be the best. And we think that we're almost there. And the Lord, just the way he does, takes a little child just to humble us. When you think, when I think that I'm something special in God's eyes and I've arrived in my spirituality and I'm the Christian that I need to be and there's nothing more to me to fix, just look at a child and say, you know what? The Lord says, if I approach him the way this child approaches him, in sincerity and in truth, that's the greatest Christian ever. The greatest person the Lord attributes in Scripture is being a child that has a simple childlike faith, has a simple childlike trust, and just dependence on the Savior. It's the greatest, the greatest in the kingdom. The greatest in the kingdom. Humble of hum, Humbleness of mind, humbleness of heart, and we'll pick it up next week uh, where we left off this week. And I want to just remind you of a couple prayer requests, and then we'll pray and be dismissed. Got to update, update today. <clears throat> Update today about Dolores Abel. Uh, her daughter is moving in with her. And so at, at this time, it doesn't seem like a nursing home is going to be uh, something that the family pursues. Just pray for the family there. Uh, also got this update, Travis Knoll, the man with an aneurysm on his heart. Uh, he cannot have that surgery until the infection in his mouth gets fixed. So pray with me, if you would, that the infection in his mouth gets fixed so they can do the procedure that they need to on his heart. Then continue to pray for Mrs. Mitchell and also pray for uh, Barbara Davis. That's Mrs. Ledbetter's sister in California. Uh, she had a stroke. And then also pray for Mrs. Ledbetter's brother, David Butler, with cancer. And then Donna Robertson, uh, also Mrs. Ledbetter's sister, having trouble breathing. 
And I did get an update on Josh King. Uh, the second procedure went well. They had to redo what they previously did, and they had to remove six more centimeters um, from his esophagus or, or something, six centimeters of something, um, and he's healing well. And then Dolores Shoebanks, that's Sherry Hargis' mom, who's 92 years old. She had a stroke, and just please continue to pray for her. And then Olga Reyes, we announced it that she had surgery, which is what we were told the date was the surgery was going to take place. I called Brother Reyes today. She did not have surgery yet. Um, her surgeon had to cancel due to COVID. And so it's going to be rescheduled for August 1st at 10 a.m. So just keep uh, Olga Reyes in your prayers. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So she got she got moved to Sage Sage Bluff. Okay. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Let's pray to support. All right, I will go ahead and pray for these requests, and then we'll be dismissed, and Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday uh, morning at 10 a.m. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the Word of God and what it shows us. I pray that we would just take its truths and apply it to our lives. Pray you be with all these folks on our prayer list, Lord. Just please be with um, you know, Dolores, Lord, and I pray that you be with her as her daughter moves in with her. I pray that that would make the situation better. I pray that you be with the daughter.